<clears throat> hey everybody, it's Pastor Thomas Boer. Uh, I wanted to kind of go through some of the discussion, brouhaha, <laughs> of um, George Gilder, his quotes, his uh, from his book Men and, Mar uh, Men and Marriage, which is being republished uh, by Canon Press, which is, as probably many of you know, um, you know, closely associated with Doug Wilson, uh, and sort of that whole, you know, the Moscow, Idaho, Toby Sumter, Jared Longshore, cross politic, fight left, feast network, all that. Um, the Twitter, the Twitter or the X or whatever we're calling it now, um, has had a lot of discussion on this. And really, if you want to know what's going to be down, coming down the pipeline in the church, in the world, honestly, Finding the right places on Twitter is is pretty much how you find out ahead of everybody else and kind of not only find out, but try to shape um, the narrative culture. I mean, really, I, I just, I, I, as I'm just sitting here thinking about it, the importance of Twitter, uh, X, whatever we're calling it now, it, it's kind of insane how important it actually is, but that's a whole different thing. All right, so... Um, I'm going to read something that I typed up, and I typed it up as a loose paraphrase quotation of uh, the cross politic episode that was just recorded, I think, yesterday. And I'm going to try to put that. Um, actually, I don't need to put that in there. What do I need to put? I want to put Jared Longshore's thing that he did on, I think, YouTube. Oh, it was an article first. Sorry, let me get that. I'm going to be basically reading from Jared Longshore's defense of Gilder, George Gilder, um, on the sexual superiority of women. And I'll put that in the first comment so you can read that along if you haven't already. Um, but before I get into Jared's thing, I'm going to actually have this sort of paraphrase quotation of the recent cross politic episode where they interviewed live George Gilder. Now they didn't release it live, but they were doing the interview live in the video. So, uh, in the comment section, you should have this article on the sexual superiority of women. Um, I shared this with some men in our church and, um, and I think it just got confusing. Uh, well, there's some disagreement on it. Uh, and, and I think just doing a video to kind of discuss through these things is going to be more helpful. I thought about even like having a screen share to show different things on Twitter, but I just don't have the time to get all that going and set up right now. So on Twitter, um, there's been a lot of discussion on this where many who have been to one degree or another supportive of Canon Press, Wilson, Moscow, and they're, what they're doing. Some of the same people who would have really appreciated their Christ is Lord billboard campaign are now kind of like, what are you doing with this George Gilder book push and some of the quotations in the book uh, and then doubling down and defending them? Um, out of all the people to sort of bring out of the ash heap of history or to, um, you know, very recent history, still living, to, to uh, reintroduce uh, a book that's 50 years old, why this one? And of course, if you go to, uh, what is their website, Men in Marriage or whatever it is right now, um, or, or Dads Are Back, I think they're calling it Dads Are Back, um, civilization is built by men with families to feed. Without the dads, we're toast. Dads are back. And then it's got this re-edition of Men in Marriage by Gilder, George Gilder, all these, you know, the, the, the sage box where you get the book, a t-shirt, stickers, you know, the same type of thing that they typically do. And then all of these endorsements from everything from National Review, which a lot of us aren't going to like now. I mean, even Doug Wilson isn't a Huge fan of National Review anymore. Ben Shapiro, um, you know, some people can't stand him for various obvious reasons. Uh, some people can tolerate him. Uh, you know, I can tolerate him, but he's not my go-to for sure. I mean, he's a God-hater. He's Christ-hater. C.R. Wiley, I like him, and he's been, I think, more defensive of Gilder in the book here, and he's given some good reasons 
for why, somewhat along the line of Doug Wilson, but there is a generational thing here to some extent also, where younger folks who have no perhaps familiar, familiarity with Gilder are just kind of like, I don't care about Gilder. I don't care that he's older. What he's saying just isn't true to reality today, isn't even theoretically accurate, at least not all the way through. You know, a Wiley, a Wilson are saying, hey, when nobody was speaking true things, he was speaking with the voice of a prophet with accuracy about what's coming down the pipeline, that the mad world that we're living in today, the feminism, maybe, I don't know, we need to get in this discussion with that. Anyways, they're painting him as like this prophet that got it right, called the shots, and also had a lot of good things to say about man and woman in marriage and so on. And I think Gilder, from reading and listening to his interviews, does have good things to say. The problem is, in some ways, the problem is a blessing. Five, ten years ago, Cannon rolls this out. I think most of the same people that are frustrated would be like, yeah, this is really helpful. I think from these men, we've kind of gotten the help that we can get from them. And we're finding older and better sources further back than 50 years to go to that are drinking from deeper wells and have more truth, more clarity, that were like, this isn't the guy we need to, you know, bring out of the woodworks here and reintroduce his book. There's some true things to be said there, but we've been getting these true things from you guys the last five, ten, whatever years. We've got that. We found better things, things that go further and get more right. That's what we need. That's what we want. This is just going to push us back to, you know, post sexual revolution in the 1970s, 1980s. We don't need that. That that was the beginning or some of the beginnings of our demise, of our downfall into the place that we are today. Um, this gets some things right, but doesn't go far enough, etc. Like those are the sorts of discussions being had right now. Um, who is George Gilder, the sage against the machine? This is on dadsareback.com. He's an icon. He's one of the leading economic and technological thinkers of the past 50 years. Men in Marriage is his seminal work on the family. He wrote the global bestseller, Wealth and Poverty, which is Ronald Reagan's most quoted book. Again, a lot of people don't give a flip about Ronald Reagan, right? Like, he gave us no-fault divorce. He's as much part of the problem as anything else. That's what you're going to hear. That's what's going to be said, and there's certainly some truth to that. Um, <clears throat> he predicted the iPhone 15. I don't even know what that is or means. A, a new edition of the iPhone? I, I don't know. The rise of Netflix in 1990 with Life After Television. He's a polymath and an influential venture capitalist. Today he lives with his life in Western Massachusetts. Now, some have pointed out, like, hey, Wilson, we know he reads things that, you know, he's not going to agree with everything. Nobody reads something that they agree with every last thing in it. You don't have to agree with everything or state every difference of a book in order to endorse it or accept it or approve of it. Well, yes and no. Um, my approval of Herman Bovink's book, The Christian Family, uh, is going to have a lot less qualification. No, no, hardly any or any qualifications. He's a, you know, a reformed theologian. Gilder's book, at the time, I don't even know if he was a Christian when he wrote it. You can find quotes of him talking about, like, you know, because he's involved in intelligent design and all that. You know, we don't even believe in that Noah's Ark stuff. And people are painting us like this. I find it kind of funny. I don't know if he's changed on that or not, but... He's a different thing. He's not a theologian. He's not a pastor. There are certain cl clarifications that need to be made in pushing this guy and his book and his content, because I do not think all of it is sound. And that's part of the frustration that people have. This is being pushed like the clarity, the goodness of what we're doing here with Gilder and his book is as equally unanimously uh, uncompromisingly good as having a billboard that says Christ is Lord, right? Like, yeah, what qualification do you need for that? Well, none really. For a book like this, written by this type of person, it's a different situation. And so the, the, the way that this was rolled out by Canon through Twitter, through the, you know, the different marketing means that we have today, I think is the biggest concern that I have, and I think that some others have. Some, yeah, I think there's some who go extreme and are just blasting everything left and right and they need to be reined in a bit. But there's legitimate concerns, I believe, with how this is being rolled out and what he's saying, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But I have to set the stage, the frame, the backdrop here to help people understand. You know, a year ago we had um, 
well, at least the first time I was aware of it, last summer, a year ago, this white boy summer movement, which I was kind of like, what is this at first? And I think they didn't do the best necessarily in rolling out certain things either, but I'd pretty much come over to the side of, yeah, this is really good stuff. And what they wanted to do to expose further issues, rot, compromise, and just ultimately at root, say it's okay to be white. It's good to be white. It's good to embrace being white. It's not wrong. It's not bad. The culture that you have as a white person in this nation is not something to apologize for or to be ashamed of. But as every other culture in the world, every other nation has a national identity that is part of who you are as a human being made in God's image of a particular tribe and tongue and nation, that is a good thing. Celebrate the good things that are there in that and do it happily. Do it without apology. And Canon and them just got, you know, tweaked about all that and lost their minds. And um, I don't remember all the, the, the intricacies of that. It was a year ago. I also had my own weird health issues stemming from a whole bunch of things going on in my life. Pressure cooker things, you know, pushing against some of the the uh, the woke madness, you know, transgender stuff, drag queen stuff in our town. A whole lot of things, but that's a completely different story. So I've been following this stuff, and it's been meaningful to me for a long time, in part because Doug Wilson, Cannon, these guys, the, their material has been so helpful. But to see what's happened in, I'd say, the last year, year and a half especially, it's just another split. It's just another divide that's here. And it's it's... I'd like to have it patched up as much as possible, but also realizing that that there's some things that are trajectories that are already set to some degree, and it is what it is to some extent. But to minimize, to, to give more light and less heat, that's my goal and aim. Not to say there isn't really any differences, kumbaya, there are, but they may not be in every instance as far apart as we are. We may be able to come together closer on some of our differences here. Um, but let's be clear where we agree, where we disagree, and not just anathematize um, each other over these things, unless or until it's evident that that really needs to occur. Who knows? We'll see. I, things change so fast right now. Who knows what three years from now is going to look like. But anyway, um, where do I want to go from here? All right, so I want to talk about the... George Gilder, what hit basically some some back and forth he had on the recent cross politic episode with Toby Sumter, who is a pastor there out in Moscow, Idaho. Gabe Wrench, who I believe is a deacon out there, and then Chocolate Knox, who I don't know if he's an office bearer in the church or not, but you know he's a member out there, and and he, you know everybody knows who he is. I think so. <laughs> uh, let me read. I probably should have just printed this out, but I have it here on the screen. So, <sighs> Sumter kind of sets it up in there and, and asks him about his quotation uh, that from Gilder's book, Bid in Marriage, which is the one that Canon Press is republishing and, and putting out there like Christ is Lord, billboard level, like, hey, everybody get this, it's prophetic, he's the man, sage against the machine, all that. In there, Gilder says in his book, the prime fact of life is the sexual superiority of women. And they basically ask him, you know, flesh that out, what that means. What, what does that mean? Well, the fuller context of that quote, which obviously still is only the bare bones of context from his book, um, Jared Longshore has in his article here that I want to look at in a moment, and I'm going to read Gilder's quote, longer quote here from his book. The difference between the sexes gives the woman the superior position in most sexual encounters. The man may push and posture, but the woman must decide. He is driven. She must set the terms and conditions, goals, and destinations of the journey. Her faculty of great natural restraint and selectivity makes the woman the sexual judge and executive, finally appraising the offerings of men, favoring one and rejecting another, and telling them what they must do to be saved or chosen. Managing the sexual nature of a healthy society, women impose the disciplines, make the choices, and summon the male efforts that support it. So I, let me say a couple things about that. One, there's things in there that you can take a certain way that are good and true and say yes and amen. There's things in there where you scratch your head and, and even, even Longshore in his defense of this says something like, yeah, I wouldn't have said it that way. I definitely would not have said it that way, and I don't think it's all together right either. And that's going to be more clear based on what Gilder said live to Sumter and, and, and Chocolate Knox and them. 
But the one thing I will say in Gilder's defense that I think everybody who's rightly kind of frustrated with what Gilder's saying and how it's being put forward by Cannon in particular is that I believe he originally wrote this in 1972. I don't believe he was a Christian at that time. Um, what you would say in 1972 or 1973, whenever it was written exactly in the 70s, is different from 2023 because the world has changed so much since then. So if he had a rewrite on it, yeah, he probably would have used different words, different languages, and so uh, different ways of expressing it. I still think what he's expressing, while it has truth in it, has you know a lot of mixed error, one-sided error in it as well. But I think it's it's you know we want to keep in mind he wasn't writing this in 2023. He was writing this in 1973, and so what he says and the way he says it speaking into the, the, the people in place, right? If we're talking about Christian nationalism and, and Stephen Wolf's book, that people in that place at that time was a little bit different than it was 50 plus years from now, uh, present day. So keeping all these qualifications in mind, on that quote from Gilder, when asked to elaborate on what he meant by it on cross politic, here's some things that Gilder said. He said, the man's link to the future passes through the womb uh, of a woman Sexuality is inherently procreative, and women play the central role in procreation. In purely sexual terms, women are where it's at. And, you know, people kind of chuckled. Men have a different role. Men are, men are more aggressive than women. Men have many capabilities that excel women. So he's certainly affirming that. We're stronger, better mathematicians in general, more interested in machines and instruments. We are crucial to the whole society, and civilization is based on these differences between the sexes. That's the theme of men and marriage. So far, so good, and amen. There's complementarianism in there, there's going to be patriarchal headship in there in some ways, but the issue of the sort of goddess saviorism of the woman to tame the man is, is the big glaring problem that's here. So Gilder goes on, the woman's superiority is in sexuality. We imagine sex is chiefly some form of pleasure seeking, begins and ends with intercourse. But really sexuality is about the bearing and nurturing of children. Women are absolutely essential. And since children are, are what connect families and men to the future, men are dependent upon women in this domain. Now I'm thinking of, what is the, uh, is it First Corinthians 11? Is it there also? Uh, where it says, you know, woman came from man, but nevertheless man is not independent of woman, because since Adam, all men have come from and through the womb of the woman. And so, there's, it, again, absolutely what he's saying here, understood scripturally in that way, it, there's no problem with that. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is right. Yes and amen. Um, Man, where is that passage at? It's not in 1 Timothy 11, is it? Maybe it's the 1 Timothy one. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody knows the one that we're talking about here. Um, what, what? Okay, sorry, where was he at? Where are we at? All right, women are dependent upon men as providers to a great extent. Again, we all agree. Well, unless you are a raging feminist. <laughs> uh, and as protectors. Uh, and many forms of creativity beyond the family tend to be dominated by men. There are different roles. God created us man and woman, and we're different. And those differences are the foundations of civilized society. Agreed. Now, at this point in the interview, Chocolate Knox comes in, and he, note, or he notes that uh, the critique around Gilder's book at this time on men and marriage uh, is that Gilder presents men in this way, that men are these brute forces going around without focus, and women are these civilizers and saviors of men's sexuality. And Gilder actually responds to that and says, yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> and everyone laughs. Gilder discusses differences, goes on to discuss differences in earnings of men and women in the workplace, etc. He says, single women earn more than comparable single men. It is only married men who out-earn married women because women are serving in their role of nurturing in the home. That's true. I don't really know what how that supports what he's saying. I, well, of course, married women are nurturing in the home and, and therefore aren't earning as much and aren't working as much. Um, I, do, I, I don't know what that has to do with his point beyond his saying that, well, single men are just kind of aimless, you know, doofuses 
lust monkeys, whatever. Uh, and until a woman comes along, domesticates him, civilizes him, saves him, you know, shows that he is part of the save of the chosen, as it said in that quote of Gilder's book, then man is this barbaric beast. Again, there, there's, there's, uh, it seems to me that it ought to be obvious that there's a lot of problems with putting it in that way. Do women help funnel and direct men and their, their sexual energy, their desires into a family, into a home, and our help meets to him in his mission in life and his calling, particularly by forming a home with him, having bearing children down to the next generation. Of course, absolutely. The issue is the feminist movement has hit, you know, accelerator, you know, warp speed levels in our nation. Uh, you can see the statistics that have been on Twitter and Facebook and stuff the last few days of it's unmarried women who vote, what, 30-something percent heavy towards Democrat. Every other group of men or women um, is either heavy or leans Republican. Uh, married women, they vote Republican. I think it was, I can't remember what percentage it was, 14%, something like that. Even unmarried men, 7% lean towards Republican. More conservative, more family values, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then married men, I think we're 21%, um, Republican, I believe. What does that tell us? Well, Gilder, I think would point out, Hey, you know, unmarried men are only 7% Republican. It jumps up to, I can't remember, it's 14 or 21% when they're married. But some of us are pointing out is how about that 30, heavy 30%, 30 plus percent of unmarried women who, if they weren't voting, our nation's issues in the government would be resolved overnight. It isn't unmarried women that are civilizing men. Not today, that's for sure. Which means it isn't a natural, timeless truth. You can't argue from natural revelation or natural law that women are these saviors and domesticators of barbaric men in these ways, in these ways that Gilder is arguing for. Was there something more true to that in the 1970s in the, the voting um, breakdown between men and women, married and unmarried? Maybe. I, I tend to think not. I mean, the feminist movement has been pushing this through. Um, I mean, look at Even Exile. Look at these different documentaries. Look at Zach Garris's book. Um, I mean, back in, into the 1800s. Now, is it true, this is a separate point that I don't think Gilder, from what I have seen, touches on too much. Maybe he does, but is it true that men who are godly men, leading as men, good men, <laughs> are they, if they're being good men and godly men, leading, protecting, providing, are they going to, by that very action, help put a, a, a you know, a, tamp down the feminism, tamp down the wickedness and depravity of these unmarried women. Yes, yes, that's true. But isn't that arguing the precise opposite point of Gilder's book? <laughs> that women civilize the men. No, men today are having to rein in and civilize the women more so than the men. But what is this showing us? It's showing us that it is a reciprocal symbiotic relationship where the man without the woman is in a bad way. The woman without the man is in a bad way. And in some ways, both civilize the other. Uh, we don't have to talk about 1970s versus 2023. This is timeless. This is natural post-fall um, in, in a post-fall world. I mean, what what is the first multiple chapters of Proverbs all about? My son Stay away from that seductress, from that immoral woman. Beware of her. Don't be led to her. She will choose you. She will save you. She will make you the chosen one. She's calling out to you for that. Don't be allured by her eyes, her, her beauty, her telling you her husband is away. She will snare you. Strong men are captured by her. Don't go down that path. Resist that. 
right? Again and again and again, that's given to you. Um, that's not a woman who's a savior. That's a woman who's a seductress, a tempter, who says she will save you, but she's really singing a wicked siren song that will slay you. And so women are not naturally, as Gilder's quote says, her faculty of great natural restraint and selectivity makes the woman the sexual judge and executive, finally appraising the offerings of men. Now notice the goddess-like language that's coming in here. Appraising the offerings of men, favoring one, rejecting another, and telling them what they must do to be saved or chosen. I'm not saying Gilder literally believes that women are goddesses. Obviously, I, I, he doesn't believe that. I don't think he believed that in 1970. I don't believe that he, he thinks that today. I do think his th thought today is very similar to what it was in, in 50 years ago because he's still standing by his book and saying, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. And he chose to put women in this particular area as sexually superior in a goddess-like position. Sexual judge, executive, evaluating the offerings of men, uh, now, sure, there's, there's obvious parallel and corollaries between spiritual idolatry and physical sexual adultery. Um, but <laughs> who offers to who? The bride of Christ, female, offers to the male, God the Father. He evaluates our offerings. There is no goddess, cult, Diana, Ephesus, cult, prostitution worship here, which, again is why the whole framing of this is really, really bad and inaccurate and not true by Gilder. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that for some this isn't more more evident, but but I, but I grant, like, you can read this and wonder, like, just a quotation without reading this guy's whole book and not knowing all the discussions going on on Twitter, on YouTube, of Canon, and, and, and all of this. If you're just completely in the dark on this and it's kind of being dropped into your lap, you're like, I don't know what this quote means. I talked to my brother-in-law about it, who's largely in the dark, dark, and he was like, what is he talking about? Saved and chosen? And it's just, it is kind of a head-scratcher. So put into the context what you're seeing him saying, it, it ain't good. It's not good. <laughs> um, now, I do think some of us... You know, you could you could fault us for saying when when Gilder in 1972 or whatever is saying her faculty of great natural restraint and selectivity makes the woman the sexual judge and executive appraising the offerings of men. This great natural restraint is he speaking in terms there of some natural law or natural theology or some of those discussions that have been going on today? Probably not in one way, but in the other way he is insofar as he's saying by nature she has a restraint and selectivity that is very strong. And again, I don't know if he's a Christian when he wrote this or not, he's not dealing with, with the realities of, of, of sin and the fall. And, and the problem is, is making women in general sound like they are very selective and restrained sexually such that they do not sleep around. They do not commit adultery. They do not save and choose men by telling them to sleep with them and fornicate or commit adultery with them when the Bible time and time again warns against that. Um, there are situations where David sees Bathsheba bathing on a roof and he brings her to him. There's also situations where you have a Jezebel, where you have the seductress, the immoral woman who's coming in and pulling the man along by the you-know-what. So it goes both ways. That's the point. But when you sort of turn woman into this goddess, innocent, pure, um, sexual judge and is executive of great moral restraint... That is or is not true, not by some nature, or some natural thing, but by the health of any given people at any given time in history. Have they been cultivated by good affections, by good common sense, and above all, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and redeemed and leavened with the word of God? Um... It's just not as simple as saying women are just naturally restrained and, 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 and pure in these ways. Now, if he would say relative to men, by nature, women are more cautious because there's literally more skin in the game. There's, there's new skin in the game. There's a baby in the womb here. And so for her to simply just sleep with any man at any time, and he does talk about this some, um, 
will make her more selective, will make her more um, slow to just sleep with a man and get pregnant with him. Uh, I think that's also self-evidently the case, not necessarily because of her natural virtuousness, but because of the reality of her nature as a woman, as a childbearer, as a nurturer, that there is more cost to sex for the woman than for the man, particularly if the man can just have sex if he wants and doesn't have any you know, shame, any societal shame or pushback, any child support to pay or whatever. Those are all well and true things. And I think Gilder in his book and in his comments does bring those things out, but he also is tying it into this sort of, you know, reducing man to this bestial beast-like state um, as a single person, as a single man that has to be civilized, domesticated, and basically taught and led by the woman, which of course does cause a lot of problems with male headship in the home and so on and so forth. Now, I don't think Gilder is consistently trying to demolish that by any means. I just don't think he realizes that the language and the ideas that he has here do uh, undermine headship in the home, male rule, patriarchy throughout society. Um, so, what else? What else can we say? So let's, let's go back to the interview they had with Gilder. Uh, where was I? Yeah, Chuck and Knox asked him about, you know, how in his book, Gilder's book, Men and Marriage, men are kind of presented as brute forces going around without focus, and women are these civilizers and saviors of men's sexuality. And Gilder says, yeah, I think that's right. Everyone laughs. Um, okay, we talked about the wage earning differences, single and married. Now, at, at, the, at that point, Chocolate Knox then pushes back and he says, this seems to make woman out to be a more moral individual, which is what I was just saying. Women weren't as invested in porn as men 30 to 40 years ago. And then eventually he's going to go on and say, but they are now, but he doesn't get to say that because, well, the conversation just moves. G Gilder jumps in and says that, um, well, I don't know if Gilder understood what Knox was saying yet because Knox didn't finish, but Here's what Gilder says. He says it's due to a breakdown of family and civilized life, marriage and family. Knox then adds that these civilized women do not really exist any longer like they did perhaps in the 70s and 80s because they are now sleeping around, doing porn, chasing careers, and, and so on. And Sumter adds that some are saying, doesn't it take two to tango? Like what I've been saying, what others are saying, it takes two to tango. So Sumter says that to Gilder, doesn't it take two to, to tango? Don't both men and women need to be civilized? And then Gilder says some okay things. He says that's why you need the church, why you need faith. The breakdown of the family is caused by a breakdown of the moral order that is fostered by churches and families and traditions and information theory. The low entropy, I think he says carriers, I don't know a whole lot about this information theory and stuff, and predictable meaning and bearing structures that accommodate unexpected creativity. I think he's getting into some of his wisdom and expertise that he has there that I don't have and I'm not even fully aware of. But the first part of his answer, I think, is right, which goes back to my bigger point. And what a lot of us are saying is, yeah, this is why you need the church. Perhaps this is where the church should be speaking to these issues in the family, in the home. And maybe Gilder shouldn't be <laughs> because I don't know if he's doing as good of a job. Uh, if he's doing a better job, then praise God. But he says, this is why you need the church. You need faith. The breakdown of the family is caused by the breakdown of the moral order. Well, that's the very thing in question here. So he doesn't really answer the question. What is the moral order? Sumter is saying, doesn't it take two to tango to create this messed up moral order? And the answer is yes, but the whole point is that Gilder's book seems to be saying, at least on this point of sexual superiority of women, that it's, it's men are these beasts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Gilder does point out that men are superior in, in, in a whole variety of ways and other ways and so on. Uh, we're stronger, we're protective providers. He'd probably even agree that we're, we're, we're typically more logically structured and better mathematicians, like you said, and all that. So um, he's not just this, this feminist male basher. And anybody who's saying something like that, I don't know if anybody is, but if they are, it's pretty stupid. Uh, to say that, but I don't really think anybody's saying that. They're just saying, look, there's good stuff in here, but a little bad leaven leavens the whole lump. This isn't good enough. Canon, why are you putting me, this guy, of all guys, forward? Um, well, Doug Wilson was very influenced by Gilder back, I think, in the 70s and 80s, uh, maybe the 80s in particular, and said, like, Canon wouldn't exist, and the good that they have done 
at least not in the form that it is, without Gilder and some of his writings and some of his works. So you see both sides of it there. Wilson was greatly helped by this guy. A lot of us appreciate Canon Press and greatly helped. But now that we're standing on the shoulders of these guys, we're actually able to see there's, there's others, bigger giants that have greater wisdom that reach much further back than 50 years ago. And we're saying, why don't we put that forward? Why don't we get this right all the way right so that we just don't reset the clock back to the 1980s and get to the same place that we're in 20, 30 years, probably even faster now. Let's go all the way back to full goodness and truth and, and beauty from God's word, from nature, from reality, as God has designed it, etc. Um, a few more things from this interview. Gilder says... Um, Well, Sumter jumps in again and says, a virtuous woman can play a role of a kind of savior or civilizer to men. Is there a comparable way in which the man is also a civilizer or savior to her? Gilder says, I think that's true. I think that's a good point. I don't focus on it in men in marriage because I think throughout human history, it has been men outside the family order who tend to be short-term, predatory, and, and, and predatory. Society is invaded every generation by barbarians, and those these barbarians are single men. They get subdued by women. This is all Gilder, pretty much a quote of Gilder. They get subdued by women and taught the long-term purposes and meanings of their sexuality, which reach through the womb of women to the birth of children who bear our genes and our inspiration and teaching into the future. And that's really the foundation of civilization. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Earlier I said maybe maybe um, Gilder wouldn't say the same thing today as he did in the book. Well, he he said that today, or he said that like a couple weeks ago or whatever, or a week or two ago. So, again, I, I don't know how, especially in light of all this, you can unqualified endorse or agree with what Gilder is saying here. Um, is it true? Go back to before the fall. It was not good for man to be alone. He had his mission from God. He knew his mission from God. He didn't need to be told his mission by the woman. God told him that. Man can and does know that without the woman, you know, woman explaining to him or whatever we call it here, uh, what it is. But he does need the woman to direct and channel in the proper sphere and way in the household, the home, one man, one woman, in order to carry out his God-given design to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. But he doesn't have to learn it from the woman. God teaches him that. Nature teaches him that. And part of the help to that is the woman, but it's not as if she is the arbiter, the judge of this, the executive of this, receiving the offerings of man and telling him whether he's chosen or not and what he needs to offer or do in order to, to get her to uncross his leg, her legs for him, to put it bluntly, to put it, I think, where he's trying to go with that. that that's just deifying the woman and, and going so beyond the reality that woman is a helpmeet and it's better to marry than to burn with passion, then, again, to, to virtually deify the woman. Woman, he says, Gilder says, this year, week or two ago, whatever it was in that interview was recorded, that men get subdued by women and taught the long-term purposes and uh, meanings of their sexuality through the woman. That's not, that's not true. I didn't go to my wife and say, oh, me stupid barbarian. Um, <laughs> what? How me make baby with you? Or, or, you know, what subdue me? Like, what, 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 you know, what does that mean? Um, uh, does he mean the beauty, the desire of a woman, the, again, the sexual superiority of a woman is the best way I can put a spin on this is such that, um, the man decides, I will give and sacrifice my life to this woman and by the woman's femininity, including her physical beauty, but all that she is and her chaste, virtuous, you know, like, when we get to Longshore's article here in a minute, you know, read your Herodotus, man. He says, you know, men will go far and wide to, to die for the woman they love in the home that they have. And so the sexual superiority, the draw that the woman has on the man subdues him to her, to rule over her. Okay, I, I can get behind, in a big picture way, some of that. But that's not all that he's saying here. That's the problem. He may be saying that to some extent, but he's, but he's bringing in this um, utter 
idiocy and barbarism that the man has and this sort of innocence and purity that woman has, which just isn't true. Um, and, and the problem is today, especially when this culture basically says that women can do no wrong, you're not going to get a receptive audience to that nonsense. You're not. And, and, and for good reason, you're not. Uh, when women can get away with, with, with murder, can be the adulteress, can take the children, even though she's the one that caused all the problems and the court system is, is you know, lopsided in that way, uh, that women are like just innocent and men are, are, are guilty until maybe proven innocent if it's even possible. These sort of overstatements and uh, almost deifying the woman rather than making the woman simply a helper to the man, that's the, the leaven that leavens the whole lump that ruins, you know, the whole salad, the whole thing that's being said here, the bread, the loaf. Uh, that's the problem. So, yeah. Um, where are we at? It has been men outside the family order that tend to be short-term, predatory. Society is invaded every generation by barbarians, and these barbarians are single men. They get subdued by women and taught the long-term purposes and meanings of their sexuality, which reach through the womb of women to the birth of children who bear our genes and our inspiration and teaching into the future. And that's really the foundation of civilization. And so he's doing some good things there. He's, he is, you know, saying, look, the, the cost, the energy, and the domesticated sphere, uh, women are fitted to that more so than men. Uh, they are, by nature, more gentle, the fairer sex, the weaker sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all that is, is true and evident by nature. But the deification of the woman, the, the sinless purity of the woman, it was Eve, if you recall, who first ate the fruit and tempted Adam to do the same. Uh, before that's, and again, that's before the fall. Women are fallen. Women are wicked. Women led men into the sin, uh, into the fall. Um, women are, are, I would argue, when you look at scripture, um, in the fall, the curse is extra heavy on them. It's heavy on them in childbearing. It's heavy on them in their desire to be over their husband, to cause conflict in marriage, to, to bristle against the headship of Adam. And for man, the ground is cursed. But for the ground, the woman is cursed too, as she's working out in a field, considering a field and buying it or planting a garden. But as I think about it, it's the first time this thought, to my knowledge, has occurred to my we little brain, <laughs> part of the curse for the man is the curse of the woman because the woman is for the man. The man has to take care of the woman. So when the woman is cursed with pain and childbearing, that's something of a curse upon the man as well. When the woman is, um, you know, struggling to desire to be over her husband, that too is a struggle for the man. And it goes back to men do take responsibility for women and for their women in Particular, And so the curse on the woman in the fall um, actually is also a curse upon the man as he takes responsibility for the woman in the home. Um, but my bigger point in all this uh, is to say, again, for the woman, she did lead the man astray. She did uh, have Adam take and eat like Satan. And so there isn't this pure innocency of women that you can definitely... Um, Interpret, and I think Gilder does wrongly sort of deify the woman in this. Now, what you're going to have said, rightly so, is do the reading. Read the book. Stephen Wolf said, do the reading. Read the book, because you can pull out some quotes from him, and it sounds kind of bad. And I've read his book, listened to it on audio, and read um, a good portion of the book in addition to reading it, um, listening to it. And that's true. Read Gilder's full book. Listen to these interviews that he's doing on here. I'm doing that, going to continue to do that. Um, but I do think that it's pretty evident that there are some things that Gilder is saying that just aren't helpful, and that needs to be just just granted. We don't agree with him on this, but there are some really good insights and things that he's also saying. It's worth reading, it's worth listening to, despite this caveat of the sort of, you know, man is this barbaric doofus until, you know, the woman subdues him and leads him along, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, then Gilder went in and said in the interview that men in marriage, uh, the Industrial Revolution, chiefly occurred in those parts of Europe where the nuclear family was best established, which is crucial to pro productivity and progress in humans. And then Gabe Branch asked at that point, by what standard is Gilder arguing that women are superior over men? Uh, I believe at that point Wrench suggests it is, uh, it is in that women are able to produce babies, men cannot, which I think we would all agree with that. Women's view of sexuality is long since she bears and nurtures children, but man's is short and is only about pleasure because he doesn't bear children. I already touched on that, and uh, I, I talked about that some, so I won't you know, rehash that or, or repeat that again here. Sorry, I just needed to adjust something. Um, well, here's Gilder's reply. He says he thinks there's too much preoccupation with the word superior in his book. He's kind of saying, look, you know, don't, don't weigh that down with too much significance or meaning. Um, and, and then he even says some things that some of us, probably myself included, would, at this point, uh, disagree with him on. He says it doesn't mean that women have to be ruthlessly, th these norms, family norms, have to be ruthlessly enforced. Not every woman that wants to be a lawyer has to now be suppressed, Gilder says, nor does a woman who wants to run for president have to be suppressed. Uh, it simply says society is based on the familial, or familial order, men supporting women for a lifetime in order to claim particular children as their own and have their genes and identities extended into the future and their lives given a long-term meaning rather than a short-term predatory sexuality. And again, it's, I don't think it's merely the way he's saying it, but all that he's saying is true. I, I, I do fall on the side of this, that he's saying some things that have some truth to them, but then are taken and escalated to a level that simply is not true, almost deifying the woman over the man, uh, which does, you know, undercut the male headship in the home. To say that man is domesticated by the woman, or as he pursues the woman, she helps him domesticate his sexual desires, his energies, his power, his strength that the Lord has given him, and that they feed off of one another in this complementary way, the, 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 the sexual superiority of the woman in her sexual beauty and design and, and nurture and femininity is a true help and complement to the man who uses his superior male strength and, and, and prowess and typically, you know, wisdom, intelligence, and so on, and, and it, it comes together where the man can rule over his wife in love, and she, as a helper, regulates his love, uh, his power, his rule, funnels it and channels it into the home as God intended, yes and amen. Um, and if that is simply all that Gilder is trying to say, then I would probably just say, yeah, this could have been said differently, kind of like Longshore says in his post, but the essence of what he is saying is true. But it does seem to me, especially in the interview with, um, you know, Sumter and, and Wrench and all them, uh, that he's not merely saying that, that he really is still saying, yeah, men kind of are these barbarian, you know, just knuckle-dragging, predatory buffoons. Women have to come in, rescue, subdue. You know, it's not Mario rescuing Princess Peach. It's man, uh, it's Beauty and the Beast or something like that, right? Where the man is just this, this, raw, you know, the woman has to come in and kind of tame him. Again, is there an element to this where the man is tempered or tamed by the woman? I, again, yes, I think that's absolutely true. But it's the sort of absolutizing of these things. You know, man is down here, woman is up here, and woman has to bring him into this thing, bring him along, subdue him, and lead him, essentially, in this. That is the problem. And it just doesn't bear out to my own personal experience uh, as I said earlier with my wife, and I think most men uh, who are Christians or were Christians when they entered into the marriage, and even those who aren't Christians would, would say, yeah, this doesn't really quite add up. I didn't go to my wife and try to see if, if I was, the, you know, the chosen for salvation or, or whatever it is. So that was from the um, Fight, Laugh, Feasts, Cross Politics discussion recently with Gilder. And then I want to read Jared Longshore's um, on the sexual superiority of women article, which I believe I linked to in the live video here. Um, I don't know if I need to read all this beginning stuff here. Just, you know, young folks, gray heads, yada, yada. Um, 
Now, now, look, I, I was pretty strong against this on Twitter because I was, I was, admittedly a bit frustrated at the time when I read this, and I'm just like, this is just not a good, this is just a garbage article or something like that. Well, I'll stand by that. I don't think he argued well in here, but I like Jared, and you know, it, it, you know, if I was sitting there to him or knew him personally, yeah, yeah I would have tempered that a little bit, but I don't. It's a different, different situation here. So, um, where are we at here? All right, so. Now for that item I think we need to nail down, namely the sexual superior superiority of women. Much of the concern arose from the following quote from Gilder. And this is the one that I've been reading to you. Um, I guess just to refresh, I'll read it again. The difference between the sexes gives the woman the superior position in most sexual encounters. The man may push and posture, but the woman must decide. He is driven, she must set the terms and conditions, goals and destinations of the journey. Her faculty of great natural restraint and selectivity makes the woman the sexual judge and executive, finally appraising the offerings of men, favoring one and rejecting another, and telling them what they must do to be saved or chosen. Now, if you didn't have the saved or chosen remark in there, I think when it says appraising the offerings of men, you might not really that you might not read that in a religious animal sacrificial sort of way, but when he puts in there telling what they must do to be saved or chosen, I don't see how you can't read it that way. It's the same sentence. Managing the sexual nature of a healthy society, women impose the disciplines, make the choices, and summon the male efforts that support it. Um, yeah, they impose the disciplines, they make the choices, they summon the male efforts that support it. Again, I think there's, there's a fair amount of truth in that last part, that statement there. Um, and he does qualify this with this being a healthy society. Um, there is something of a discipline imposed by women because they're going to only marry and go to bed with a godly man. But we're not in a healthy society today. And then the question, that's where the bigger question discussion is going on today, that, that the society of today isn't what it was in 1973 when this book, I believe, was first published. All right, so Longshore comments on that quote by Gilder, and he says, It is not surprising to me that a generation of men who are fed up with feminism balk at this quote. So it acknowledges that feminism run amok in this generation. He's granting, yeah, this isn't surprising. We have all had enough of Disney's depiction of a numb skull father being disrespected by his daughter who lives under his yoke of bondage as she looks for liberty in all the, of the wrong places. But I do think that there may be something in the water if this quote has you hot, so hot under the collar that you can't see the truth in it. Well, like I said, I, I see some truth in this, having looked at it. I, I don't think all those criticizing Longshore and others fail to see any truth in it, but we're saying we're not interested in seeing some truth here. We want the full truth, and we want that to be up front and center by canon press. Anyway, put simply, woman is, Sumter says, put simply, woman is more glorious than man. Paul says man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, 1 Corinthians eleven seven. Uh, we do not need biblical revelation for this point. Just look at the two creatures standing side by side. This is not a difficult observation. Man has his strength, woman her beauty. Uh, let me just pause there. Um, I think this is what really probably tweaked me the most, his argument and, and you know, exegesis here. To why, whatever degree... We want to affirm or say it's possible that in First Corinthians 11, the physical beauty of the woman relates to her glory um, and therefore the manifested glory of man that is being veiled by her, you know, her, covering her head or her, you know, I, I believe the fight last feats folks do not believe in head coverings and just say that the hair is the covering. However, we want to delineate all of that. I, I, it's a pretty big stretch to make that passage out to be primarily about the physical beauty of the woman, uh, merely that, you know, simpliciter, uh, and then say, look, man is, is strong, but he's ugly. A woman may not be strong, but she's beautiful, and therefore man is the image of glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Well, as others pointed out on Twitter, okay, if woman is more glorious than man in this blanket statement way, then doesn't this make man more glorious than God, since it says man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. 
I, he, he doesn't defend that or argue or even address that potential objection at all in his article. On Twitter, I did see people bringing that up, which I was going to do if no one else did. And last I saw, which was yesterday, I've had family over, so I haven't been able to follow it too closely. Um, he just said, well, you're, that, that ignores or that's not seeing the creator-creature you know, distinction. Um, which, if people are listening this long, you probably at least know something of the creator-creature distinction. But if not, uh, I, I assume, I believe his argument from that is going to be, well, it's different because God is the creator and we're the creature. And so as creatures, we can be the glory of God in the sense that we're the height or the capstone of creation as men uh, to be his vice regents, to reflect his glory, and to be the crown of God's creation, to be the, the, the manifested glory of God in his work of creation. But we do this as creatures, and therefore, as creatures, we cannot leapfrog the glory of God as creator. We display his creative glory, but we are not the creators. We are maybe sub-creators under him, some might say, but you know, we are creatures, and therefore, because of the creator-creature distinction, I guess Longshore is trying to say, therefore, I can argue the way that I'm arguing. Um, to me, there's a lot of fancy footwork. Uh, granting that God is the creator, and granting, thankfully, not that I or anyone else would have really believed that Longshore would say that man has superior glory, or the superior being to God, um, the logic still doesn't follow. It still doesn't work. Man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. The parallel that is there, uh, Longshore is, is undermining. He's cutting in the opposite direction of. Even if you grant this creator-creature distinction, you would still have this problem where the woman, being the glory of the man, is somehow to say that she's superior to the man. Well, what does the rest of... Uh, in this area, at least, uh, of physical beauty that, that is the only real thing that Longshore re relates it to here, oddly. Which, again, none, none of that makes sense. But what does the rest of 1 Corinthians 11 say? That was verse 7. Um, very next verse. Uh says, uh, let me read 7 and then 8 again. For a man indeed not, ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. That's verse 8. So here's the for. What is the therefore, therefore? What is the for, therefore? For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Okay. And every commentator I know of that's reformed says that this shows that the woman is a helper to man and not superior to man, but under the man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. None of that is ringing superiority. It is actually ringing inferiority. <laughs> man is not from the woman. The woman is from the man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. I suppose you could try to read it in the opposite direction, but I think to do that, you kind of have to bring along this sort of gilderizing goddess like nature of the woman, that the woman is um, from the man and created for the man in order, if he, she's superior in these ways, to, to, to lead the man, to guide the man. And here this is where this really is going to tweak people who are involved with the Amy Bird thing. Amy Bird argues similarly that man, when he sees a woman, beholds his telos, his end, his goal, what man is to become as the bride of Christ. And then she just extrapolates on out and says, hey, new creation's begun. Christ is here. Christ is in heaven. We're redeemed in Christ. There's neither male nor female. And she gets her feminist mystique exegesis, the sort of goddess divine thing that you're hearing smacks of here in Gilder's work. Now, you might say you're, you're, you're eisegeting Gilder. You're reading into him. Amy Bird and modern day issues and assumptions. If I am, I hope I, I would stop doing that. But for me and for others, we're reading Gilder and we're saying, he, he's going in this direction some. He's saying some good things, but he's also going some in this direction on these matters. And that's a big problem, especially in our day with feminism and women are goddesses going, going hog wild. Um, 
Now, it goes on in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 11. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And of course, we know that's a, disp a disputed, debated passage. Um, the, the, you know what? As I think about this, I don't know if this is true or not. Um, I, I believe for a little bit there, Toby Sumter was watching this, but if, if he or someone else knows, they, it'd be great if they could leave a comment here. But I believe a lot of the guys out there at Fight, Laugh, Feast, Cross Politic, I believe they hold to the Genesis 6 view of um, demons mating with women, seeing their beauty. I wonder if they also are looking at the, this passage this way, that the angels are the fallen angels, seeing the beauty of women, therefore their glory, their beauty has to be covered so that we don't have a repeat where... You know, the demons mate with the women and have demigod babies, which supposedly the giants came from. Now, I used to think that was just kind of an innocent difference of interpretation there that doesn't really have much of a meaning because it's an obscure thing. But if you're bringing that all up into the natures of men and women and what the demons want to do with women, and you're getting feminist mystical exegesis coming out of this, this is not a trifling difference. Um... You know, needless to say, I don't hold to the position that uh, demons can mate with women and have spirit demon demigod babies with them or whatever exactly the argument is. Um, that's problematic, I think, in itself. I, let's, let's be crass, you know, blunt about it here. Um, demons don't have physical fleshly penises. They don't have semen sperm. They don't, they can't impregnate a woman. Um, unless you can argue a miracle that's, that's not far off of, you know, Mary conceiving by the power of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And maybe some defend it that way. Well, if, if the Holy Spirit can cause Mary to conceive, but that's different because he didn't, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, he did not have intercourse, obviously with Mary. So I don't know. I don't know if that has anything to do with their arguments here. I just think if that's the case, and I, I suspect that might have something to do with it, of what Longshore is saving, I just uh, saying it would be good to get some clarification on that because I just think that's completely wrong-headed, and shows that that whole discussion about you know the, the sons of Adam mating with the daughters of men actually being very important if you go to a passage like First Corinthians eleven uh, and and start importing stuff like that into there. But anyways, continuing on to verse eleven of First Corinthians eleven. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. There's your qualification, your, your balance the Lord gives us in verses 11 and 12. The whole logic of 1 Corinthians 11 is telling us that, 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 that in some ways here, man is the superior over the woman. That, um, back to verse 7, a man indeed ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. He's the one that lead in the church, right? The whole context is here is, is, is shameful for a woman to not be covered. It's shameful for a man to be covered with long hair. And if you go back to verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 11, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. The head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. That nothing that Longshore is saying here fits 1 Corinthians 11. I'm just going to be blunt about it. What he is saying here is best I can understand in his defense that I saw on Twitter of the creator-creature distinct, distinction as weak as a cop-out is, is bogus. It is garbage. I'm sorry, Jared. I appreciate you, but this is just a garbage argument in my humble opinion. <laughs> and if you think my words are garbage, you know, we're, we're, we're men. We can call each other their arguments garbage and still get along. Because we're men, not women. <laughs> um, this is just bad. This is just poor. It needs to be called out. Because if you keep going down this road, it's going to get bad. It's going to get dangerous. It's going to get more and more problematic if you double down on these things and, and people imbibe some of this stuff. And then they find Amy Bird and whatever. It gets worse and worse, potentially. Yeah, I know. I'm arguing the slippery slope. But things have been getting pretty slippery lately in these last few years. Um... You know, the woman is under the headship of man. Um, this doesn't elevate woman over the man. Everything is arguing 
the opposite here. And the balance comes in verses 11 and 12, that man and woman are not independent of one another. Woman came from the man, but man also now comes from the woman through the womb of the woman, and all things are from God. So going back to Longshore's article, and I'll try to wrap this up because I don't know how long this video is, but I know it's long. Um, where are we? Yeah, put simply, Longshore alleges woman is more glorious than man. Paul says man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Uh, we do, Again, just the whole framing of this is not that, that woman is more glorious or less glorious in that way, in that sense. It, it That's a whole misunderstanding of it. So I'm going to have to do this just to try to give something to root it, because the question is going to be, what is it talking about more specifically? Well, let me just read um, Matthew Poole here, a commentator on 1 Corinthians 11, 7. For man indeed ought not to cover his head. Covering the head, being in those countries a token of subjection, a man ought to uphold the power, preeminence, and authority with which God hath invested him, and not to cover his head further than it is naturally covered with hair. For, and then he goes on in the Bible verse uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven seven 7 from the King James. For as much as he is the image and glory of God. And then Paul comments on that. Because he, man, hath a peculiar cause of glorying in God as he to whom alone he is subject, and therefore ought by no habits or postures to show himself in subjection to others, or because God glorieth in him as a most excellent piece of his workmanship. God is represented in man. Now, this is talking about not generic man, mankind, but God is represented in man, male. Paul useth to, useth to call that one's glory wherein he glorieth, 2 Corinthians 1, 12 and 14, 1 Thessalonians 2, 20. So David calleth God his glory, and Solomon tells us, Proverbs 17, 6, uh, that the glory of children are their fathers. So as the apostle here uses a double argument for the man's not covering of his head, one being because the man is immediately subject to God and therefore ought not by any habits or civil rights to show his natural subjection to men that are not by nature his superiors. For we must not think that the apostle by this argument forbiddeth subjection to natural, economic, or political superiors. And two, because God glorieth in man. God glories in man. So a glorying in man Again, the question isn't about, like Longshore is making it, a superior or inferior glory. But he's, he's, it seems like he's trying to do that in order to somewhat rescue Gilder on this point uh, in his quote in his book. Whereas I wish they would just come out and say, yeah, in talking with Gilder, we, we, we grant he's wrong on this point. But it doesn't spoil the whole book with this caveat here of this mistaken understanding. Just like we have to caveat a C.S. Lewis all the time with some of his broken understanding, in part because he wasn't a theologian and a pastor, as as, uh, as Gilder isn't either. If they could just come out and say that, I think everybody can at least move along here and say, okay, maybe there is some good stuff in this book, or you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to stick to better things. So far, to my knowledge, that hasn't exactly happened. Um, yeah, and then Paul goes on and talks about the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Um, here the apostle openeth for proof of what he had said, but before said of the woman's being the glory of the man. The woman is made of the man. The woman is not made of a rib taken out of the woman, but the woman was made of a rib taken out of the man. We have the history, Genesis 2, and from hence the apostle argue of her subjection to the man. So this is about subjection to the man because she's taken from the man, not that because the woman is the glory of the man, the woman is superior to the man. But that's what Longshore is saying. You might say, well, this is just Matthew Poole. I haven't looked at all the commentaries, but I can almost guarantee you none of them are taking it. None, none of the reformed ones are taking it the way Longshore is taking it. I can just go down the line and list through these, and if someone wants to do it themselves, they can. But I'm pretty confident that no one's going to take it like Longshore, and most are going to take it very similarly to how Paul's doing it here, Matthew Poole. Um, and I know Matthew Henry's going to be similar because I've read his stuff before. Um, 
First Corinthians eleven nine, Matthew Poole says we have this expounded, Genesis two eighteen, right? Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man, where God said, It is not good that man should be alone, I will make him and help meet for him. God did not first create the woman and then make man a meet help for her, but he first made the man and then the woman that she might be a meet help for him. Now it is a rule and reason that whoever whosoever or whatsoever is made for another person or thing is less excellent than that person or thing for which the other is made. Did you catch that? <laughs> it is a rule in reason and logic that whosoever or whatsoever is made for another person or thing is less excellent than that person or thing for which the other is made. Okay, so if the woman is made for the man, she's made for another person, and therefore she is less excellent than the person or thing for which the other is made. Again, if you want to go down the road of what is superior or inferior between male and female, man and woman, in 1 Corinthians 11, it is the male that is superior, not the female. But that's the opposite of what Longshore is arguing. And I'm just saying, just abort mission here, man. Like, this gives into a bigger discussion. You know, John Moody has some good things uh, to say on this. I mean, to me it is self-evident, and he's kind of saying this is self-evident to others too. There's a lot of posturing in the pecking order on Twitter and other places, it gets political, it gets, I want to border on saying just sinful. I don't know if all of it's sinful, but certainly when you're just there to posture, to get more clicks, to get more likes, to stay in the pecking order, to get more press, um, and part of that is to have more influence and maybe even at the end of the day to have more money. Um, you got to check your heart and see what your motives are. If you start distorting truth just to double and triple down, if you can never say, I was wrong here, forgive me, because that would cost you too much clout or that would cost you um, rank and influence. If you have to present yourself as this sage that can never speak wrong and that's what you're, you're living off of, well, if you are wrong and you keep doubling down on that, you're a hypocrite and you're a fraud. I say that I'm wrong, and, and I don't mean that in a boastful way. I mean, that'd be a weird thing to boast of. I say I'm wrong. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I appreciate most the men, especially if they have some prominence because they're few and far between, who can say, you know what? I said this here, and it was wrong. It was inaccurate. I've, I've learned better now. And so I commend to you this or that person who helped me this. Or maybe they don't even mention who helped them to understand that. It just came to see that they were wrong. It takes humility. It's hard to do that. But I actually think most people are going to respect you more when you do that. And so I would just urge, you know, Jared Longshore and others, if and when, God willing, they see, yeah, I'm just kind of pushing down here on this to defend my boys. Which I kind of think is happening with Gary DeMar and uh, a bunch of other things too out there right now in Canon Press. If you would just come clean. And I'm not saying they're doing this self-consciously right now. Like, no, I know I'm wrong. I'm just going to do this. I think they, they, they don't see that yet. But if and when they come to see that and they confess that, oh, how beautiful and how wonderful that will be. And perhaps, perhaps you're saying, well, you're misguided to even insinuate that. I, 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 I'm not trying to, to uh, impute motives here. I'm simply saying what it appears to be like, and it's hard not to draw certain conclusions from that, from all the data and evidence of, of how things work in online spaces and Twitter and so on. Oh, you ruffians over there of your blog posts and your Twitters, when they do the same things, they just happen to have 50,000 followers or 100,000 or whatever um, because they played the game well. And they legitimately have some really good things to say that I benefit from and like and share myself. Um, but anyways, back to Longshore's article. Again, I'll repeat it one more time. He says, put simply, woman is more glorious than man. Paul says, man is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. First Corinthians 11, 7. Well, I hope for Matthew Poole and everything I've said and read to you here and, and just argued that Matthew Poole would just laugh in Longshore's face at that, at that statement. We do not need biblical revelation for this point, Longshore says. Just look at the two creatures standing side by side. This is not a difficult observation. Man has his strength, woman her beauty really has very little to do with the issue at hand or what 1 Corinthians 11 is getting into. But, you ask, this is Longshore saying this, but, you ask, Gilder sure seems to put the lady in, char in charge of sexual matters. 
Okay, I will bite, Longshore says. So he does grant this here, and good for him for doing this. I appreciate this, Longshore. Okay, I will bite. In the first place, I wouldn't have said it just like Gilder did. In the second place, don't take all the fun out of the world. The husband is the head of his wife, yes, and this certainly applies to sex. Wives submit themselves to their own husbands, and this certainly applies to sex. And the Bible also says that a wife has the right to control her husband's body. True. Okay. <laughs> that's right. The right to control. N nobody, nobody, like he's saying that as if that's a shocker to us. Nobody here denies that. Nobody here who's on the other side of the issue here with Cannon and Longshore is like, oh, what? Control, I'm triggered by this. I don't think anybody, nobody is, is upset by the Bible saying that. Like, I don't know what Longshore is trying to do here. That's right, the right to control. And that power to control your own body is a power that you do not have. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. He goes on and says, so you have power over her body, and she does not have power over her own body. At the same time, she has power over your body, and you do not have power over your own body. This is the point where you're to laugh like a good Chestertonian. <sighs> I get so sick of the mimicking of Wilson. You can't mimic Wilson. You can't do it. You can't do it, Jared. You can't do it. None of you guys out there. Like, Wilson is Wilson, and you are not. I'm none of us are Wilson. Wilson is great, and he'll he'll pull out Chesterton and Chestertonian, and I know you guys love him, and I love Doug Wilson too in many ways. But you just you, your mimicking of him just doesn't look good. You know, saluting him, um, learning from him, taking some things from Wilson, and then incorporating it into yourself is great. But just just kind of almost going whole hog in like this just reads straight out of a Wilson blog post. This is the point where you're to laugh like a good Chestertonian and say something like, the foolishness of God confounds the wisdom of this age. <sighs> I actually don't think that's the case. I don't think it's actually that befuddling what, what, what Paul is saying here. He, he, you know, it... <laughs> uh, Jared is just making a mess of things here, I think. And I hate to say that because I do like him. Um, but... Well, there's a lot of good say. I'm just going to hold back certain things. But, you know, truly, I, I appreciate you guys, but you're just making a mess of things here. Um, the wife has authority over her own body, but also has to defer to the husband's authority over her body because they're one flesh. And likewise, the husband has authority over his body, but also has to defer to the authority of the wife over his body, too. It's it's We're one flesh, so we have to operate with consideration to one another. In sickness and health, in riches and poverty... You know, till death do you part. Like, is it not pretty evident? It's, it's, these are things that are being talked about here. Not Chestertonian belly laugh, the, the foolishness of God confounds the wisdom of this age. Um, don't know what all this means. Like, there's a deep mystery that we can't understand here. Like, I, I don't know, I don't even know what Longshore is trying to get at here in any of this. It's, it's, like I said, this is kind of a, it is a garbage post. I'm sorry. Um, let, let, let's, let's just rewind and read this again for a second. Um, Longshore says, But you ask, Gilder sure seems to put the lady in charge of sexual matters. Okay, I will bite. In the first place, I wouldn't have said it just like Gilder did. In the second place, don't take all the fun out of the world. The husband is the head of his wife. Yes. And this certainly applies to sex. Wives submit themselves to their own husbands, as, and this certainly applies to sex. And the Bible also says that a wife has the right to control her husband's body. Agreed. If, if my wife wants my body, needs my body for sex, you, unless there's something unusual going on, you've got the flu, you're puking your brains out or whatever, husbands should comply. Not only that, if the wife needs you to take out the trash or to, you know, do something heavy with your physical strength of your body that the woman needs your help with, you should do it. Or if you cannot do it, don't know how to do it, I don't know what it is. I'm not, sadly, the most uh, gifted by any means and... Uh, need to work on that, you know, manual building, making things. If you can't do it and it needs to be done because your wife needs something in her chicken coop or you know, whatever it may be, then you typically probably, yeah, need to do what you can to help her with that. If it's a true need, now you're the head of the home, you might say, hey, honey, this isn't needed and we're not going to do that right now. But you shouldn't just cop out because you don't want to use your body and are too lazy to do the labor that probably does need to be done or 
if it's some advanced thing, hired help, whatever. Um, but nobody argue. I don't know anybody really who's who's arguing that or disputing that. That's just a, a non sequitur, a, a distraction, a red a red herring. It's going off into other things um, that are not germane to the whole discussion here on Gilder. Um, and so yeah, he says. The Bible also says the wife has the right to control her husband's body. That's right, the right to control. And that power, to control your own body, is a power that you do not have. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. So you have power over her body, and she does not have power over her own body. Yes. <laughs> and at the same time, she has power over your body, and you do not have power over your own body. Yeah, because you're one flesh. Because... What's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. That's true, and yet the two become one flesh without the two being completely dissolved. I still have my own brain, she has her brain. She has her desires, I have my desires. But when the body is one, one spirit, one body, two become one flesh, body and soul, I am hers, body and soul, she is mine, there is this matter of the power of your body isn't solely your power any longer because you're one flesh with her her body isn't solely her body any longer it is yours as well because you have a right to one another's bodies this is in first corinthians 7 principles of ma marriage he didn't i don't believe put in verse 3 right before it that says um let me just go back to the beginning of the chapter now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband, and let each woman domesticate the man and, and, and be a goddess over him. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, going back to the whole Gilder thing for a second there. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Actually, I want to bring out something else. Back to the Gilder thing in verse 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Longshore, you see that? <laughs> it even says let each woman have her own husband because of sexual immorality. Because, hey, maybe women are sexually immoral too. Which is the whole kit and caboodle here of the frustration with what Gilder was saying. At best, the framing of what he's saying, but more in reality, the error in what he is saying. That women are almost these goddesses that re, like receive the offerings of men and adjudicate it because of their natural restraint. Bible doesn't say that. Bible says they're sexually immoral too, and also need men, one husband, for sexual pleasure. And Gilder also said sex is primarily about procreation, not pleasure. I, I think it's it's pretty equal, actually. I think it's both pleasure and procreation. God didn't make it so pleasurable for no reason, and he didn't make it so productive for having children for no reason. It's, it's, it's both, and the two blend together because the family, the children, are supposed to be both a pleasure and a duty, to have children, to delight in them, to, to raise them for the Lord, and, and so on and so forth. Um, where am I? Let's see. Let the husband render to his wife the affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Th this isn't some deep, profound mystery. It, it, it's pretty clear what... <laughs> Um, what Paul is saying here. These are practical principles that are given to the church in Corinth due to sexual immorality. Longshore is saying, give a Chestertonian belly laugh here and like act like, don't know what that means. That, that seems to be what he's saying. That isn't helpful at all. You know, we need to pastor people here and not spout platitudes about Chestertonian belly laughs to mimic Doug Wilson. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Your. I can look up in the Greek, but it sure looks like here your is plural, male and female. Give to each other. Share your bodies because you are one flesh for the sake of not falling into sexual immorality. <sighs> and Longshore is going on and on about Chestertonian belly laughs and mystery and and thinks that someone like 
me or others who are pushing back on them have a problem with the fact that it says that women have a right to our bodies also control of it. It's just, it's either posturing or just completely ignorant of what the real discussions are even going on here. That, that's just the truth. Longshore doesn't get it or is playing dumb um, because they're too close to everybody knit together in Moscow. I, th that, that's what it sure seems like. And again, I like Jared. I like stuff that he's said. I, I'll be honest, I've listened to him very little compared to Doug Wilson or even a Toby Sumter in cross politic. But, you know, I think we're all fighting for the angels here. That's why we don't want to see this drift into just another, you know, political thing that gets big and goes soft and just, just triples down on protecting each other rather than protecting the truth of God and his word, full-throatedly. And sometimes we have to help each other see blind spots. Anyway, he goes on. Here's another thing Longshore says. If a young man finds himself dumbstruck by the beauty of a lady, and in order to take her as a wife, he must get the nod from her father, the way to go, of course... Then his interest in the fair lady does him all sorts of good. Um, okay. He really shapes up, which is a good thing for society. That basic principle is what Gilder is driving at in the quote above. I don't, I, I, and again, I would say yes, Gilder is getting at that to some extent, but he goes beyond that and deifies the woman and makes the woman the broker in that. And I, I, if you didn't prompt Gilder, I wonder if he would even say, well, of course you need to go to the father. Because he's not putting the impetus on the father to broker this for the daughter. Gilder is putting the woman in the place, the driver's seat here. Men are offering it to her. So I, I just don't think... I think Longshore's up the creek without a paddle here. If I might throw a bit more salt, Longshore says, into the soup that may now be at a rolling boil... Solomon tells us that the woman's sexual glory is, quote, more terrible than an army with banners. <laughs> as long as Solomon 6-4, I don't know, you know, let's get into Song of Solomon and talk about sexual glory here. Um, Habakkuk uses this same language to talk about the armies of the Chaldeans who are dreadful with horses swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Um... Habakkuk 1.8. Now, I'm not recommending that you tell your wife she's more fierce than an evening wolf. Use the Solomonic poetry at your own risk. Okay, whatever. But I'm saying that you should appreciate what Gilder is driving at. Women are sexually superior to us. That's why many of us have gone to stealing them, and then we have fought wars over them. Read your Herodotus, man. <laughs> and I want to be like, come on, Longshore, did either one of us really even know what of anything about Herodotus before Doug Wilson introduced classical Christian schools and put that in an omnibus curriculum? I mean, maybe you did. I don't know, but <sighs> come on. That is why the angels once came down and tried to steal the women from us. And yes, that is another story to be told at another time. Oh, there it is. There it is. There, so, so he is bringing that in here. Maybe that's why that went into my head. He is bringing in the demon angel sex stuff. <laughs> the demon angel sex stuff. That is why the angels once came down and, tr down and tried to steal the women from us. He's talking about Genesis, what is it, Genesis 6. And yes, that is a story to be told another time. Maybe, but he's, he's imputing that also, I think, into 1 Corinthians 11, as we talked about earlier. This is, this is just bad, bad stuff. For now, the sexual superiority of women is why, when men act as they ought, they go to war to protect women and the children that crop up in their wombs. So... Let, let me just pause that for a moment. Is the root reason that men fight for the ladies is because the ladies are just so sexy? I'm not denying this part of it. Don't get me wrong, I'm not denying that. But is that the... You know, this is the taming of the woman, right? Uh, the, no, the, the taming of the man, right? Man, these women are beautiful. I want to sleep in with them, have wonderful sex with them. I better go to war for them. Like... That that's just kind of a again such a one sided silly you know comical way to present things. I, mean, I, I almost think you know Herodotus yeah I, you know read through that but think of Odysseus in the Odyssey. He wants to get back to his wife and children. He wants to get back to his home to his family. It's not because his wife was necessarily this smoking hot babe, Penelope right was her name. 
I mean, he's on the island with the, the beautiful sea nymph. I think he does sleep with her. But the call of home, the place, the belonging, the family, the, the, the children, the home, the the anger of the suitors taking his wife because it's been years and she wants, you know, she's holding out for him, the devotion that's there. Odysseus wasn't like, you know, man, my wife's just so smoking hot. Even after 20 years, she's still going to be this, you know, babe. I got to go fight for her. You know, beauty is fleeting, charm is deceitful, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Obviously, Odysseus, Herodotus, none of these people are Christians. They're all pagans. And if you're just making a natural all argument here, okay, I still don't think the fundamental reason here is just the beauty of the woman. Yes, I understand uh, the Iliad and Helen of Troy is the most beautiful woman. And so the gods come down and take her and get all that. Is that virtue? Do you want to argue that that's, that's what we should be like, Jared? Because I'm not following the point here. I thought that the gods were bad. <laughs> I thought that taking the women, Helen of Troy and all this stuff was, you know, bad. I thought, you know, the women offering, the, I forget who it is, now, Aphrodite, all the women offering Paris the apple picked me to be the most beautiful one. And then the, the arguing cat fighting was all bad sexual stuff. Um... So I'm just utterly kind of at a loss for some of the things that, that Jared's even trying to say here. Um, so yeah, he says, For now the sexual superiority of women is why when men act as they ought, they go to war to protect women and the children that crop up in their wombs. Now remember, he's the sum total of sexual superiority of women that he has put in this blog article, this post here, that that I have seen, that I'm remembering from the short article, is that put a man and a woman side by side, it's obvious men are stronger, but women are just hotter, beautiful. And, you know, yes, in history, in time, chivalry, beauty, there is a sexual superiority that women have there of their beauty that can draw men to them, and there's a good, a good in that. I, nobody is arguing that. It's the degree to which you're elevating this thing. And, you know, taking 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 7, all these passages to, to contort, to fit, to, to uh, defend George Gilder here. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, you know, what? what is, uh, is it Mulan or, you know... <laughs> What is the, where the song is like, it's a girl we're fighting for, you know, like everybody understands that. Like I, nobody has, for, well, I'm, I'm sure there's some who have forgotten this, but, but I don't think most people opposing canon on this issue or just differing with them is like forgotten. Women are physically more attractive and beautiful and it's okay. It's good to desire the beauty of women in that way. And it can help channel men to it can help them commit to this one woman, form a family, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't always do that because of sin, but it can do that. But, you know, the issue is that the deification of women, that they're pure and innocent in the framing of that, that Gilder's putting in, that women are also seductresses, that we're warned to, you know, stay away from the Jezebels in Scripture, that Solomon fell prey, that Samson fell prey to Delilah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this feminized culture where women can do no wrong, it's curious that we're not willing to also be able to affirm these realities of the sinfulness of women, of the sexual immorality of women, that they need a husband too for sexual delight and pleasure and restraint, that they aren't naturally restrained and, um, you know, just leading men, evaluating their offerings so that the man can discover if he's chosen or saved in some sort of feministic, mystique, goddess, predestination thing that's going on. Anyway. Um, for now, the sexual superiority of women is why I just read that. Okay. I have taught the principle of male leadership many times. Men who understand that God simply wired a patriarchal world are not thrown off by acknowledging the ways in which women are superior. And neither are we, my brother. Neither are we. Women are more beautiful than men. They're, they're feminine. And they have good nurturing qualities in the home. Amen. And when Gilder says that and gets that right, amen. But when he gets it wrong and deifies the woman, not amen. That's what's being said here. In fact, acknowledging that very thing can motivate many men to marry one of these creatures and become her head. 
we need to see more of that kind of thing. So go ahead and get a copy of Gilder's book, Men and Marriage, at dadsareback.com. So, so there you have it. This has been a long, arduous journey, but I think it's important. And you got to talk about it when everybody's talking about it, or else it's like showing up to a conversation, a town hall after the town hall's over, or something like that. So you got to talk about it when everybody's there and ready to listen. That's why I recorded this. Hope it's been helpful. Uh, if you didn't catch all of it, you can catch the replay. I'll post it on YouTube and stuff. Thanks and God bless.